Hi, good morning and welcome back to our distinguished guests here at the Netherlands Pavilion at the Dubai Expo and also, of course, our online guests. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Ruben Dubelaar, uh, representing Holland Circular Hotspot. And in the second part of today, we're going to discuss construction and infrastructure and how to make that circular. And that's very important. Um, I think about 60% of the raw materials that are used worldwide are connected to the construction industry. So if we cannot change the construction industry, we cannot achieve a circular economy. Um, we just had a plenary opening session to, to see what um, the policies are about, what the idea is about circular economy. We saw a nice presentation of uh, Michiel Raaphorst of V8 about what the pavilion is about. And in this discussion, we kind of take a deep dive into the, the, uh, the topic uh, with some best practices, both from the UAE as well as the Netherlands. We have the, the city of uh, Almere who's joining us. They have a big event, uh, the largest horticultural fair in three weeks' time, where they're going to showcase some very circular innovations. We also see from the seaport of Groningen uh, in the north of the Netherlands how they deal with all the materials that flow in and out of the harbor, so a lot of waste streams as well, and how can you turn that into a circular approach. And we're very glad also to host the uh, AESG, um, to talk about uh, yeah, sustainable best practices here in the UAE. Uh, in between, we'll share some of the technologies that you see in the pavilion, uh, some very short videos, some nice teasers, and then we have a panel discussion with also um, a bit of a mix between Dutch organization, the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management will join, and also Bureau Happelt of, um, of the UAE. So, uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to a great session again. And, uh, well, without further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor again to, to Peter Diaz, Director International at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management, to kick this off and also to give an introduction on uh, circular infrastructure and construction in the Netherlands. Peter, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, as I told this uh, morning in the beginning, the concept of a circular economy is crucial. It's a crucial instrument in the combat against climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution of our environment. And now, with, with adopting the concept of a circular economy, we can reduce, reuse, and recycle the resources we use in the economy, becoming smart and efficient, creating value without wasting valuable resources. Now, why did we choose to focus this seminar on the topic of building an infrastructure? I think the answer is quite simple, because this sector has an enormous impact on our environment. Now, bear with me for some details. The building and construction sector is responsible for 50, 50, not 1, 5, 5, 0, 50 percent of all use of raw materials. Forty percent, four zero, forty percent of total energy use, and thirty percent of total water use. And on top of that, the construction and demolition waste we discard in the Netherlands causes thirty five percent of all CO two emissions. Now, fortunately, in the Netherlands, we reuse around 97%, 97% of all the discarded materials from the building and construction sector, although most often in low-value application in infrastructure. Now, already in the 80s of last century, regulations in the Netherlands forced the building sector to demolish buildings carefully and separate the different materials in order to reuse and recycle as much as possible. And since then, governmental interventions in the built environment focused on energy efficiency of buildings with gradual rising legal environmental performance requirements. And nowadays, we consider, by example, 
a mandatory requirement for the use of material passports for all buildings. Now, regulations are not enough to make the transition towards a circular economy. Innovations within the value chain are necessary to find new solutions. Innovations in better waste collection, sorting and recycling, as well as innovations in circular design of business models, products and materials. And that is why the Dutch government took the initiative to sign a voluntary agreement with the building and construction sector to reach ambitious and specific targets. We call it the National Concrete Agreement. It was signed in, 19, uh, in 2018 and it had two main targets. A 30% reduction of CO2 emissions in 2030 and in the same year a 100% high quality recycling of demolished material, of demolished concrete. <coughs> now, inspired by this national covenant, a national steel construction agreement is in the making. And for the effectiveness of those agreements, it's a big help that the government not only acts as regulator, but also as a public procurer. That creates a natural demand pool on the market. Right now, we're building circular bicycle roads. We have a public and private bridge bank, and we develop circular viaduct viaducts. It's interesting to see that there is so much uh, uh, dynamism, it's dynamic in the building and construction sector. Dutch architects uh, show with the Dutch pavilion at the Dubai Expo what can be done if we look differently. You heard about it this morning. To the materials we use, to the products we make, to the business concept we use to become circular and climate neutral in the way we build, construct, and take apart at the end of the life cycle. And it's just amazing how innovators such as Dutch startups, companies, come up with innovative solutions to improve sorting and recycling of construction materials for demolition. Furthermore, it's very promising that companies have taken the initiative to launch a voluntary scheme on extended producer responsibility on facade elements of buildings. And what do you think of the rapid development of circular by design solutions such as prefab and modular systems in the construction sector? I wonder, is that the fundamental game changer of the sector? Well, I presume that at least those innovations will help improve quality, lower costs, and CO2 emissions substantially. Now, these creative initiatives do not and will not come by themselves. These need an enabling environment, exchanges across the world and within platforms, in which companies and governments work together in public-private networks, across borders and along the value chain. And the Netherlands government is committed to be an active partner in this. I hope, I'm convinced, that we will have a fruitful dialogue with each other, inspire each other, listen to each other, and raise critical questions to learn from each other. Worldwide, the sector can become circular and climate neutral, but only if we trust each other, work together, and if we all have the courage to invest in innovations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this, well, s setting the scene and to see what, what's happening in the Netherlands and how to connect. Um, I would like to announce our, our next speaker, and let, let's dive into the best practices from the UAE. We've seen some of the Dutch innovations. Um, and the next speaker I would like to introduce is Lindsay Malcolm, Associate Director of Sustainability at AESG. Lindsay, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
So yeah, so I wanted to give you all a little bit of a perspective on what's happening within <clears throat> the industry here in the UAE. Um, for those that don't know us, AESG are a specialist consultancy engineering and advisory firm. We're headqu headquartered here in Dubai, but also based in London, Singapore, and Saudi Arabia. So we have a very good understanding of the industry here. The company has been working in construction across uh, all different sectors and aspects for the last 10 years and really trying to push the changes in the industry and help drive thought leadership and innovation as much as we can. Um, in terms of the UAE market, I, I think there's a few interesting things to consider as a starting point. And it's quite interesting to contrast that with what's happening in the Netherlands, in Europe, and from my own personal experience in Singapore and Southeast Asia as well. Um, within the market here, circularity is emerging as a concept, I think it's fair to say. There is a good level of understanding. There is a policy and practice in place. The UAE launched last year its uh, circular economy policy looking at what's happening over the next 10 years from 21 to 31. This is very much about trying to put in place practice, trying to understand what can be done. Um, and the UAE is on a trajectory to try and be a fully circular economy by 2071 which would be in line with the centennial for the country. And this is sitting in the context of a net zero strategy for 2050 and significant development over the coming years. Dubai is an interesting market. The population here is about 90% expat, which means, particularly in the construction industry, you have a wide variety of global perspectives. As such, what you get is an array of, of best practice, experience, and understanding from all around the world. We all come into the market here sharing ideas that we've seen in other places, bringing innovations and new thinking. And what that means is that, I think from my perspective, I feel like circular thinking isn't standard practice here yet, but what you're seeing is a lot of exemplars, innovations, and interesting approaches. And it's starting to drive change, particularly from a business perspective, with, with large developers and operators really thinking about what their environmental impacts are, carbon-based thinking is driving people to think not just about what are our consumption and emissions at the moment, but what's our full life cycle impact. And there's a lot of work that's being done within the materials sector, um, both in, in steel and concrete industries in particular, but looking with the Expo and some of the amazing designs that are happening here to really change the way people are thinking about materials management. As you can see from what I'm showing here, the, the focus for the, uh, the policy and for the industry is very much about getting a balance with manufacturing, infrastructure, transportation, but also, quite interestingly, looking at food production and consumption, which is a big thing here for, for sort of uh, in innovations around materiality, around uh, use, around delivery, around plastics, around sourcing. As a country, we bring so much in from outside. Thinking about how that can be done in a circular fashion is definitely one of the more interesting challenges. To share a bit of the construction industry context, um, I think it's fair to say at the moment that within construction practices, circular thinking is, is uh, a little behind other places. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, right now, there is a, a relatively low level of recycling as standard practice, which is sort of the first step when we want to think about circular approaches. We have policies, we have sustainability certification standards in place that push this, but one of the biggest challenges is around segregation of waste and actually engaging with, with contractors and those on site to really understand what do we have here and what can we do with it. I think the big challenge for us as professionals is to highlight that waste isn't just waste, but it's actually a resource, and that this is something we can do more with. Um, and I think it was particularly interesting the, the, the transition within the Dutch market, moving away from low value use of waste materials into high value usage. And I think that's something we should definitely be looking at here. There are a lot of interesting practices that are happening. There is a big push in the market around prefabrication and modular construction. And I think that's really driving uh, a level of new thinking and uh, innovation within construction practices and actually looking then at the whole life cycle for buildings. Right now, there's interest from a, a time, cost, and quality perspective. But I think as we, we grow to understand more of the, the long-term benefits around the ability to dismantle buildings, to support change in function and adaptability, to respond to climate change and have levels of resilience, these uh, the advantages of, of prefabricated systems of, of modular components of the sort of Lego block style of construction I think are really going to come to the fore. And I think with that, 
for us as designers, as, as engineers and innovators in the built environment, both from, from buildings and in infrastructure, there's a real need to think about design efficiency and actually thinking about what, what are we building, why are we building it, and how can we do so more efficiently? How are our spaces going to be used? How can we create a level of flexibility and adaptability so that the building isn't just created for a single purpose, but actually could support change across its life cycle? And the building can continue to be used not just for sort of 20 or 30 years, but for 50, 60, or 100 years. And that in itself creates a level of, of efficiency and it supports that circularity of thinking because the longer you use something, the less you have to consider what happens at the end of life because the end of life becomes a much further concept. Um, the final two bits I wanted to touch on around the, the industry context here. Uh, the first is around operational practices. Um, I touched a little bit on the design side of things. With construction, I think there is a behavioral change mindset that can be introduced in the market. It was something that was really interesting to see with the projects here on Expo, that the approach is taken across the entire of the site are very, very different to what normally happens in, in the region as standard practice. And I think changing the way people manage resources through the construction process, changing the way those resources are brought to site, changing the way that we think about the, the construction process, the offcuts, the, the waste that's generated, and even little things like making sure that we're not doing certain types of maintenance or, or using contaminating chemicals or doing refueling in areas that then contaminate batches of waste that could be taken away and reused elsewhere. And finally, I just wanted to touch on the idea around green procurement. And this is something that we're seeing coming to the fore a lot, both from a government level and from a, a development level. And the, the idea around what, what do we need and how do we use it and using that as a way to change the, the longer term thinking. And the procurement side of things is, is for me kind of the first step when you're looking at circularity. We had a really interesting experience with, with a couple of developers here who were talking about material data banks and looking at what are the resources left over at the end of projects and how do we integrate these into the flows for future projects. Finally, I just wanted to give a little bit of an example of a case study that is a project that we're working on at the moment. This is the first large master plan project we've seen in the region that integrates circular thinking from the outset. So right now we're, we're conceptually designing, um, but the client is keen for this entire development throughout the whole of the master plan to be net zero and to be fully circular. So the project is in Jebel Jais, which is in Ras al Khaimah, one of the Northern Emirates. It's high up in the mountains and creating a, a community of residential hospitality and tourist areas. The location challenges are really the key driver behind the waste considerations here. They want to be bringing less resources into the development, managing what they have through the process of reuse and repair, resource recovery, and, and clean production to try and minimize their impacts and keep everything contained within the community. And as a result, then putting as minimal waste as possible into the, the municipal recycling infrastructure networks. Um, the challenge here is, is twofold. Um, we're trying to innovate from a design and operational perspective, but it's very early stages. We don't know who's going to be building this, and we don't know who's going to be operating. And so we don't really have the engagement with the people who are going to be able to impact this and really push through the circular thinking. Um, but there is a big push around supply chain engagement, and there is an understanding that the early stages are the times to be having these conversations and to really be pushing this kind of thinking through, which is a really great thing to see. So to close out, I think within the, the Emirates, within the Middle East region and, and further afield, there is a huge opportunity here for innovative thinking. We can see that from the expertise that comes in from outside and particularly in the context of the, the Netherlands Pavilion here at Expo. And I think as, as several other people have mentioned before, communication is the most important thing that we have to have. We have to talk to everybody to, to understand their perspectives, their expectations and to really share the approaches and make sure that we're all on the same page. So thank you. Lindsay, thank you very much for, for joining us and, uh, and for your presentation. And also good to see, I think it's all about this global experience that you need as well. So you bring in experience from Singapore, from other projects, and that's what we need. Communication worldwide and exchange of best practices that are out there throughout the world. So thank you very much. And later on, ASG is joining us in the panel. So we look forward to the discussion as well. Just uh, as in between, uh, we'll go to a short video of Apferhegge, which was already mentioned uh, by Michiel, 
one of the inno uh, uh, innovations here in the panel on the water. Let's have a quick look at the video and then we get back to the next presentation. My name is uh, Op Verregge. I'm a sculptor and I'm an inventor. I came up with the idea to build a completely self-sustainable glacier in the middle of the desert. We unite energy, water and food. The energy, the solar systems on the roof, they power the Sun Glacier machine. It produces water that falls down. The water is cleaned and reused to grow plants. Our technology is uh, not really complex. We blow hot air inside a closed room and inside there is a circulation of cold water. We have a basement that's filled with water. The water is cooled and pumped up to the roof and by showers all the water drops go down through the air. But what happens? The hot air comes into the container and the moisture in the air attaches to the water drips, so they grow. And that's why we call it a growing waterfall. That goes so fast that we can produce here between 1,000 and 2,000 liters of water a day. We invented a new method of condensation that would work everywhere on this planet. This is the result of 10 years' work and uh, I'm very proud to uh, show it to the world. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a wonderful technology and also it, it shows the importance to connect innovations together because if you have all these solutions as a one standing solution, it doesn't work, it needs to be a total approach. So having said that, um, to our next speaker, um, we go to, to Helene van Wijk of Seaport Groningen. Uh, well, you have a total concept at the port as well. Over to you, uh, Helene, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you all for, uh, for having me here. I'm Helene van Wijk. I'm business manager Circular Economy at Groningen Seaports. Uh, we are... <coughs> I'll start with the disclaimer, I do not have COVID. <laughs> I already had it a month ago and I'm still coughing. <laughs> and aircoats and airplanes don't make it better, so I will be coughing a bit <laughs> during my presentation. Uh, having said that, <laughs> Uh, we are a port in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, actually, we have two ports, Port of Eemshaven and Port of Delfzijl. And as you can see on the picture, um, we are not only a port, but we have a big industrial area. And we always say we have that industrial area, and that's our main focus. And that we have a port that's good for the logistics, but we are not specialized in containers and in shipping, like, for example, Port of Rotterdam is. Uh, next to a CEO, we also have a harbor master. He's very happy with the ships in the forefront of the picture. <laughs> but the industrial area behind it, that's our main focus. And that will also be the main focus of my, uh, of my presentation. So we are, and uh, we do a lot of international presentations. And then we always have three keywords uh, which describes what we are. We are a port, we have a chemical cluster, and we're located in Europe. So that's why we call ourselves Camport Europe. And we do that with the Northern Netherlands. So not only with the port of Delfzijl, but also with the province of Groningen, Friesland, and Drenthe. And in our specific port, we have different clusters and different industrial propositions on which we focus. We have energy and data in uh, Eemshaven, and specifically in energy, we are specialized in offshore wind. Uh, we're quite close to uh, Germany and uh, also to the German offshore wind farms. And uh, like a decade ago, we started to uh, specialize in offshore wind. And uh, last year, the 18th wind uh, farm, which was um, operated and maintained and installed from Eemshaven, was announced. So that's a, a real specialty of ours. Uh, that's in Eemshaven. In Dafzel we have chemistry and circular economy, and of the latter I'm uh, responsible. So first, a quick look uh, at Eemshaven. As I said, energy and data. Data means data centers. Uh, uh, the digital uh, uh, proposition is for uh, the Northern Netherlands still very important. Uh, but we have also a broad energy mix. We have offshore wind, onshore wind. We have the Nornet cable to uh, Nor Norwegian. We have uh, the Cobra cable to Denmark. Uh, we have solar farms. Uh, we, have, uh, we still have gas uh, as well. So we have a broad mix of, uh, of energy. 
But today we're going to talk about Delft cell. And in Delft cell we have a chemical and circular cluster. And uh, which is important to mention, we do not only attract uh, chemical and uh, circular companies uh, who recycle in their process, but we also recycle in the park itself. As you can see, we have a steam pipeline here. It's uh, waste to energy uh, from the waste to energy plant uh, that we have in Delft Cell, and it uh, supplies a lot of uh, residual heat to different kind of factories. Well, that's one project that we have, but we do have a broad utility system, and I will tell more about that in my next slides. For us, it's very important to work in value chains and to have synergy between the companies that we facilitate in the port. So therein we work in the feedstock technology market principle, we call that. So we not only talk to uh, recyclers who have a technology to recycle plastics, for example, to recycle steel or to recycle uh, different kind of materials. Now we also talk to feedstock companies and we talk to a market. Well, if you, for example, go to wind blade recycling, we not only talk to the recyclers, but also to the wind blade producers, to the supply chain who are active in the logistics of the offshore wind farms, and to the market, which in case of offshore wind is building and construction, but also the automotive industry. So we actively connect these parties together in different kind of consortiums. And in each of those consortiums, I will tell a bit more about that, uh, but we always want at least one feedstock, one technology and one market party. And we prefer to have more of each of those parties, of course. So we do that for different kind of uh, feedstock that we have in the port. And when we started with uh, specializing in circular economy, we really looked at what are we good at? Which kind of feedstock uh, streams do we have in the port? Well, as I said, we're uh, specialized in wind blades and uh, we have installed a lot of wind farms from our port. But in the next years, a lot of wind farms will be uh, decommissioned already. So um, set aside the plans that the government have to build a lot more wind farms. We already expect that 8,000 wind blades will come back to our port in the next years with the farms that are already uh, built uh, close to our port. So they need to be recycled and in wind blades there's composites which are uh, meant to make it very strong <laughs> and so very hard to recycle. So that's of course a challenge, but we do have a project in that. <coughs> And I will explain a bit more. Well, as I said, we have uh, data centers in the port. Uh, so we do have a lot of e-waste as well, not only from the data centers, but also from all the offices that we have in the city of Groningen, which we work closely with. Uh, so e-waste recycling and battery recycling is also one of our focal points. Well, building materials, that is something that we have in the port from, uh, from the start, so from the 60s and the 70s. We have a lot of companies who are in the secondary materials for big building and infrastructural projects, so that is one of our uh, focal points. Plastics, of course, uh, uh, are everywhere nowadays, and they're all in every proposition of every port, uh, but also in ours, and I will explain a bit more about that as well. And then textiles, also uh, part of the feedstock streams that we have quite a lot in, uh, in the Northern Netherlands. And uh, for both plastics and textiles, we do have a lot of recyclers, which we talk to, who make building materials from uh, uh, plastic waste and from textile waste. So in uh, those projects, we work together with Building in Groningen. Uh, it's Building with a capital G, Building Innovation in Groningen, which is a research center at the University of Groningen, and they specialize in innovation in building projects. Of course, in the North Netherlands, we do have the small earthquakes that we all know about, and uh, that also brings a lot of opportunities, because we have a lot of R&D going on in, uh, in building projects in, uh, in the North Netherlands. And a lot is uh, being rebuilt, we have a lot of temporary uh, uh, houses, so a lot of innovation is going on there and it's very important to have all those temporary houses uh, circular designed of course because you're going to set them up and you're going to transport them again. So that's one of our uh, focal points in the whole uh, province of Groningen. Yeah, so as I said, we call ourselves Gemport Europe and we work together with the three provinces. And uh, the most important thing that we uh, want to achieve is to improve regional economic structure by supporting business in their productivity, innovation and growth. And uh, well, I had 
um, like the key pillars that we have, um, but those are very general, but we really look into it in a technical way. So in the Northern Netherlands, we say we're not good in plastics, but we're good in specifically polyolefins in packaging and specifically in polycondensates in packaging. And when we acquire new companies to the Northern Netherlands, we do that together with the NAM and with the NFIA, of course, we really look which companies complement to the companies that we already have. Of course, we like a bit of competition because that's always good for the price, but we do not want companies to get each other out of the market, especially not because we're not that big as a region. So for us, it's very important to focus on the technical value chains that we have and to the specific companies that we want to work with. Well, why the Northern Netherlands? Well, we have uh, a lot to offer to companies uh, uh, that want to settle there. We have a cohesive ecosystem. We have access to green feedstock and energy. We have a lot of agricultural hinterland, of course, which is uh, uh, important for the bioplastics, for example. Uh, but we also have a lot of hydrogen available and we're actively working on that. And in circular economy, we see that hydrogen is coming more and more important, not specifically for energy, but also for the technical processes. For example, hydrogenation, which do quite a lot of chemical companies. And we see that having hydrogen in the region is a, a big factor for companies to, uh, to come to our region. For example, for the Israeli uh, tech company Clariter, which focuses on, uh, on plastic recycling. Uh, one of the key factors why they uh, uh, chose to settle in our region was the availability of hydrogen. Well then, specifically on to building and construction, because that's why we are here, of course. <laughs> Uh, in our port, we have divided our clusters between different specific areas. And for circular economy, we have, we call it the Oosterhoorn Zuid. <laughs> and that is the area that you see here. So in the north, we have the chemical park, which is changing into bio-based chemicals. But at the Oosterhoorn Zuid, we are facilitating a circular park. Well, as you can see at this picture, it's quite empty. So three years ago, I worked for five years for the port now, but three years ago, I got the assignment. We have a big field <laughs> and we need a lot of circular factories here. And we need a business case to pre-invest in this area because this is too much of a green field. And for circular uh, companies, it's not that attractive. We need utilities, we need to have the sites uh, preloaded, we need more roads and all kinds of infrastructure. And we need that in a circular way. So together with my team, I started to calculate on a business case, started to acquire new companies to our region. Uh, at that moment, our circular perspective was a bit uh, on the lower side, so we really needed to build up that, uh, that proposition. And we started to work on this field. And uh, with great success, so that's always good uh, to tell, of course. At the moment, we have uh, offers and uh, mostly paid reservations and already some contracts in this whole area. So this is the, uh, um, these are the uh, sites that the companies have chosen. So we have divided the area in different uh, uh, deelgebieden, so to say. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, um, planned infrastructure, we have planned a utility corridor, we have planned new roads, uh, we have planned a new quay because circular economy needs uh, waterbound locations, of course. And last week, we finally announced that we're going to invest 33, uh, uh, 43 million in this area in the next year. So we already have that budget and we're going to uh, spend it on this area. Because if uh, the planning uh, stays as, as it is at the moment, in the next five years, 21 factories <laughs> will be building in our port. And that is a huge amount. We never had that before in the Northern Netherlands, so we were quite... <laughs> Uh, shocked ourselves when we did all the calculations and we found out what the numbers were. Uh, the municipalities were as well. Uh, the municipality of Ames Delta, for example, is going to hire 40 new employees because they need to have a lot uh, to do with the permitting licensing and with the uh, zoning plans. Uh, the province of Groningen already hired 14 new specialists in permitting. So it's, it's a great story, specifically for the people who live next to our port to get a lot of new jobs in all different kind of levels. Uh, so we're very, uh, me and my team are very proud of, uh, of this story. 
Um, and uh, we are going to build this park in a complete circular way. So we already have a lot of uh, tenders going on with, uh, with building companies. We want secondary materials here, not, uh, not virgin sand, for example, so to say, but secondary uh, building materials, roads uh, we have from Lignan. We have all different kinds of uh, um, circular materials because when you build a circular park, you need to do that in a circular way as well. And we have a lot of utilities that are planned in our region. It's hydrogen, it's steam, it's nitrogen, all different kind of utilities for those companies to plug into uh, because that, of course, is very important in order to uh, uh, reduce the CO2 emissions of companies. Uh, we actively have an, uh, an innovation team with a technical background and with every company that wants to settle in our region, we have uh, extensive conversations on how they could plug into our ecosystem and how they could change sometimes the technique or the schedule of their plant. Sometimes that goes quite far, so some companies need to get uh, used to it because we really dive into their business case as well. But in the end, we see it's, it's a lot better for our sustainable goals. It's better for their business case uh, most often, and it's good for the synergy uh, in the park. So two, uh, and I think I'm running out of time a bit, so two best practices, <laughs> and I will keep that quite short. As I said, we work in consortiums. Uh, uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, we announced uh, a consortium specifically for uh, wind blade recycling. Uh, all these companies, it looks like a lot of text, but it's all companies' names who are involved in this consortium. And we have all the players that you need to have in order to recycle uh, wind blades. And uh, we'll do that together with uh, Boost Terminal, which you see here in Eemshaven. And uh, we're very happy with, uh, with this consortium. Uh, we also have the University of Groningen aligned to get R&D and innovation in the consortium as well. And what we do here is um, cascading the different kind of options that you have when you do wind blade recycling. For example, we have Nielsen Group, who is uh, there somewhere here, yeah, Nielsen Metal Recycling, and they are in the uh, metal industry and in the cement industry. And it's like um, a low value solution to recycle composites. But it is uh, a way to get the wheels in motion and to get uh, the system going. But we have a lot of different other companies who are higher up in the value chain, who, for example, make uh, fibers from composites who are um, uh, valuable for the automotive industry, for the dashboards, for example. But we also have uh, good connections with the yacht industry to make composites that are uh, uh, ready to use again for, uh, for yachts. So we really try to get it as high up in the value chain as possible. And uh, for all the companies that um, connect to our consortium, it's important for them to know. So we're very transparent in it that we always go for the highest value that is possible. So not only for the cheapest uh, uh, business case. And another best practice that we have is in uh, plastic recycling. We have quite a lot of plastic hey, recyclers. Hey Elaine, hey Elaine, uh, we need to finish up in uh, yeah, one minute. Seconds. No, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of plastic recyclers, and they are working together in pre-sorting and also cascading again in different kind of materials. Uh, if you have the well, Bollegraaf is uh, involved in the separation. They are here in the uh, room as well. If you have like the high level, uh, high value uh, solutions, it's for example new solvents and waxes. But if you have the lower value solutions, it's for example the cray that we have in our port, which is going to be made of recycled plastics as well. So also in there, we try to cascade the different kind of, uh, of feedstock streams. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> if you want you to know much, more, <laughs> yeah, I'll be here all day. <laughs> And of course, you're going to be here for the yeah. full day, so, yeah. so plenty of time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elaine, for, for sharing this. And I think it's very important to show, you know, if you want to start a circular economy, it starts small or on the level of an area where you want to bring the value chain together. I think that's the main takeaway and the key point. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a short video in between again, uh, a video of one of the innovators, and that's Bureau Belen. Let's have a look at the video. My name is Lenneke Langhuizen for Bureau Berlin, a design studio based in Amsterdam. We designed the canopy and the curtain. The bioplastics are PLA, a polylactic acid, based on corn. 
and we developed with Dutch parties from the raw material, the yarn that we spun, and these three meter panels are connected to a 44 meter wide fabric that forms this curtain. We see the vegetation of the UAE laser cut it in this uh, large curtain. This is actually the base that forms once the, the fossil fuels. We colored the material with the oxides of the sheet piles where the Dutch pavilion is built with. The canopy is also made of these biotextiles that are made of PLA with a reason. They are very UV fast compared to the fossil based textiles that are used now for outdoor fabrics. These fabrics break down under the sun and come as microplastics into our environment. Our textile, they are renewable resources. So we made a UVA and UVB split and it blocks the UVA rays and it lets through the UVB rays. And these are the rays that makes you produce vitamin D within your body. Within countries where we protect ourselves for the sun, it could be very helpful to have a textile like this with the vitamin D shortage there is worldwide. For our next speaker, let's move from the north of the Netherlands to, well, let's say the middle of the Netherlands. Quite a new province, uh, if you take it compared to the other provinces. Uh, our next speaker is from the city of Almere, Sabine Strijbos. Thank you very Sabine, much. Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, for having me here. It's quite an honor to be here in Dubai and in the Dutch Pavilion. Um, today, um, I'm going to walk you through uh, the approach in the circular area development we uh, developed in the city of Almere, and we implemented uh, at some bridges uh, at the Floriade site. The Floriade is a world expo, which will open in three weeks already in Almere. Almere is situated 20 kilometers from Amsterdam, so you know. So why is the transition towards a circular economy very important? We already heard uh, quite some uh, uh, things, but I still want to walk you through the social challenges we face in the Netherlands, and I'm pretty sure there are challenges which we'll face all over the world. Water drought and regulation and the biodiversity which will decline, and the food production is taking place too far from the city. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, we have to build one million new houses and four million new houses have to be uh, renovated. And in addition to that, we have 85,000 bridges that have to be renovated or replaced. And imagine that, I heard just uh, from uh, Mr. Diaz, 40, uh, 50, 40, 30% in the construction um, world. It's amazing if you consider the materials uh, we have to use for that. The, uh, we have a failure cost of 16 billion years uh, um, per year. So we really have to reduce these failure costs in, con in the construction world. Uh, there's a huge, uh, huge skills gap. We really have to, to boost the circular economy. We have to get new uh, skills and new... Um, uh, well, we have to have new skills to boost the circular economy like that. We are in the middle of the energy transition. The packaging industry can do really a lot better. And uh, last but not least, the COVID. We all uh, realized that uh, last year the borders were closed, so the raw materials and the products loop um, was nearly still. Um, when you um, plan and uh, develop a city or an object, you go through different phases, so the planning, design, uh, build, maintain, and the upcycle phase. So if you have a look at the city or an object, there's a lot of residual waste coming from, um, from the cities. This can be biomass, like you see here, the giant hogweed or water plants or grass. It can be um, the rubble, concrete, or everything. Uh, actually, you want to keep all these materials, all this residual waste, you want to keep this in your city, and through all kinds of techniques, you want to make new raw materials out of it so you can put them further into new products. So, for example, from giant hogweed, we mix it with plastics and we put it into new traffic lights. Um, we say 
now we have a raw material loop. But next to this loop, we also have a financial loop because behind every residual waste flow, there's a lot of costs going on. And if you want, actually you want to convert these costs into value um, and put it into the new materials and products. And last but not least, we have a data loop. And I can't emphasize enough, in a circular economy, data is really, really important. Because behind every arrow, there's a lot of data we need to know. Data about when is this residual flow coming from the city, what's the quality, what's the quantity, when can we reuse it again. Uh, and at the moment, uh, we as an organization, uh, uh, we, ha we don't have these uh, data just yet in order. And we call this um, uh, area information. So I told you a little bit about the Floriade World Expo. It's a horticultural uh, world expo, and it will already open in uh, three weeks. 13th of April, our king will open the expo. Um, and it's going to be uh, the uh, green solution to a livable and healthy and sustainable city. Um, with uh, the themes of growing green cities, so we're not going to focus only on food and uh, on, um, uh, on uh, plants and the biodiversity, but also how can we green the city, how can we feed the city, how can we have a more healthy city, and uh, uh, what, uh, which kind of innovations we have on the energy. <coughs> so actually, how did we put this circular approach into practice at the Floriade bridges. And how did we come from the innovation to really impact? So we built, uh, there were four bridges, and two bridges were built with the uh, com uh, company Reimert and the TO Pau Group. And they had a really good innovation uh, on concrete, because they had an innovation on cementless concrete. And um, together with the, um, so the, the the left uh, uh, picture is a, is a picture of 80 meters, and uh, they uh, had an invention of putting cementless concrete together with the rubble concrete uh, from the city of Almere into a new concrete, and they managed to put it also on the constructive parts, and this has never been done before. Normally, if you have rubble, concrete, uh, which we just heard, it is put underneath roads, let's say. And this is really into, uh, into the constructions of uh, the bridge. Well, the tubular pipe piles were recycled. The, um, the railings f uh, are from reinforced steel, uh, recycled. And the upper railing from wood, from uh, old bridges from uh, Almere. Um, the second bridge is, uh, well, it's called the rubble bridge because we use a lot of residual waste in, uh, in this bridge. Uh, the second bridge is also a bridge of 80 meters, also with the concrete uh, uh, cement. It's called the beaver bridge because there's a beaver housing at the Floriade site. And the beaver is a uh, protected animal in the Netherlands. So we had to have a very nice design because we had to build around the beaver bridge um, and um, a lot of plants are uh, uh, put on this bridge too. So together with this co um, cementless uh, concrete, we managed to save uh, 57 tons of uh, CO2. CO2. Um, the third bridge um, we realized with the company Dura Vermeer, and they used a lot of uh, residual waste from an old pedestrian bridge, uh, which was over a national highway in the Netherlands. And the fourth bridge, um, it's not on the sign, but we, uh, it's a project together with the uh, uh, University of Eindhoven, Technical University, and it's a bio-based bridge. And this bridge is, has three um, very high-tech sens uh, sensors. This is sensoring our measuring the behavior of the material so that we can learn from all this uh, data. So data again to make the bridges even more, more circular. So how did we capture actually all the data which comes from the planning and the and building? Um, uh, we used a, a 5D collaboration IT system where every stakeholder 
all which were uh, building the bridges, but also uh, the roads which had to connect on the bridge, uh, they can put their data into this system. And um, so every partner has all the time verified and validated data. So actually, no more hassle with different plans or elevation plans in every mailbox. Everybody knows you, you get a new plan and you design your bridge on it. But another party has another plan, so the bridge will not connect on the road. And that's not really practical. So what we want is from the left side to the right side. So we want to go to from 2D planning and cost and flat, let's say, PDFs to into uh, 2D plus 3D, 4D planning, 5D planning, where you can see the actual situation, how it's built. Um, so you can see up front if there are perhaps any problems with what I just said, that the bridge is not connecting to the road. Normally, this is, um, uh, is done uh, on site, but now you can see it up front, so the failure cost will go down. And the communication between the client and the contractors will improve. I'd say ready outside is a digital twin, um, because you have as built situation in the systems, and all the data will then be transferred to our um, IT systems then for, uh, from uh, the city of Almere. Um, this is really uh, cost, cost and time efficient. And the third and last slide uh, I have, so I'd always say material loop, data loop, and also competences, because if we don't have the right competences and the 21st second skills, uh, century skills, we cannot push this circular economy forward. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Sabrina. And uh, I think it's a great example how the infrastructure can be, well, uh, how you can pilot tho those elements and how you can keep materials in the loop over there. And, and are you ready for the opening in three weeks' time? You are. Good. So I guess we're all invited to, to, to come and see the bridge for ourselves. So thank you very much. Um, in between, let's have a quick look at the next video. Uh, another innovator here in the pavilion is Marjan Aubel. The solar experience is uh, part of the Dutch biotope, where food, energy and water are combined. And we're taking care of the energy part. So we're using organic solar panels. They're printed on very thin foil. And what you see is a very colorful uh, solar experience. Normally we think about solar, think about these blue panels, but now we have the possibility to use something which is very beautiful and poetic and playful. Using the energy from our organic solar panels. Solar energy is very important because we have this uh, beautiful source of energy called the sun and it's uh, hitting the earth all the time constantly and we're not making enough use of it. Now we're really like looking down in the ground for oil and stuff and but we have this source and it's a very democratic source because it's for everyone. It has so much potential and it's already one of the cheapest sources of energy and I think solar should be everywhere. The next step is to really start a solar movement. We're not only like uh, working as a designer, but we're really like forming a group with scientists, uh, philosophers, to really show all these new potential. So this is a very nice example, but to really work together and uh, really start this movement. So up till now, I think we've seen some great examples of what can be done in circular economy, but it's also, of course, very important to have a good discussion about it. So we'd like to invite a panel um, to discuss what we've seen so far. Uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Olaf Scholte of Signify, Katharina Hasbani of AESG, uh, Raya Jabbar of Bureau Heppels, and Arnoud Passenier of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Please have a seat. Uh, hi. Does it work? 
Are you comfortable? Yeah. Comfortable? Great. Um, I suggest we first do a quick round of introductions so you can briefly introduce yourselves and then we get into the discussions. Olaf, may, may I invite you to briefly kick off? Yes, thank you. So my name is Olaf Scholte. I, uh, I work for Philips Lighting and now Signify since uh, over 20 years. Uh, of which about 10 years here in uh, Dubai. I worked in uh, several segments on uh, energy saving projects and uh, recently more focusing on the uh, agriculture segment. Perfect, thank you. Katarina. Katarina Uherová Hasbani. I'm uh, originally from Slovakia. I'm a partner and global director for strategy in ASG. We are a specialized technical consultancy dedicated solely to build an infrastructure environment and our services are oriented towards sustainability and environmental protection. And uh, my background in this region um, is about 15 years of my professional experience spent in uh, government and uh, management consulting roles. But in my past, uh, I've been also a public commission for the European uh, Commission. I've uh, assisted in development of energy efficiency and renewables directives. So uh, this topic is, uh, you know, part of my life for 20 years now. So I'm excited to be on the panel. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Raya, over to you. Uh, Raya Jauhar, I I'm an associate at Burr Happold, uh, currently leading the sustainability consultancy for Burr Happold. Burr Happold is an engineering and consultancy practice. Globally, main HQ is in the UK, but we have a strong presence in the Middle East and in Dubai. I've been in the region for more than 12 years now, working with architects, urban planners, governmental entity, defining what sustainable design means to them and de delivering sustainable design and, and strategies across the different spectrum. Looking forward to the discussion today. Yeah, great to have you in the, in the panel and see so much of uh, uh, experience from, from the region. So thank you very much. Arnaud. Yes, uh, my name is Arnold Pasnier. I'm working at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands. As uh, Peter Diaz already told, uh, also um, including the um, uh, environmental policies in the Netherlands. Um, I'm responsible for um, spreading the seedlings of the circular economy worldwide. Um, and um, happy to, um, to join the discussion, but also to... Um, uh, to be inspired by uh, all those uh, new examples in the world on, uh, uh, on circular economy and how to innovate uh, together. And I think that um, I can uh, help with um, connecting people, but also connecting those uh, innovations uh, worldwide. Perfect. And I think that's a very important part of it, to, to connect all those innovations and see how we can collaborate to, to create a better ecosystem. Katarina, maybe I may I ask you first. You, you've seen a lot of presentations, uh, some short videos. Um, you're familiar with the topic. What, what, are the, the, what are the things that, that struck you most? And what do you, if you compare it to the UA region, what's, you know, what's the difficult step, next step? Well, uh, and this is something that I've been thinking a lot as we are trying to scale uh, circular economy in uh, our sector, um, you know, how do we make it happen? <laughs> yep. Is it, what is the driver of the decisions? And what we've landed on is, uh, is that there needs to be a commitment top down. <laughs> the leadership, um, whether it's government, authority, or a private sector company, the leadership needs to be committed to the topic beyond just developing a business model. And you know, we consultants, we love business models, right? We are always trying to find a business model, but very often uh, we have to be, I think, intellectually honest with ourselves. In sustainability, uh, there is not always a business model. <laughs> there needs to be a commitment to implementing new innovations, you know, new things that come at a cost, right? And I think what is the biggest difference between what I've seen in the presentations and what we see in this market is that here there is commitment, it's coming, it's progressively building across the value chain, right? But it's not yet there where it is in Europe and in Netherlands specifically, right? I see a lot of commitment to thinking things through from the design all the way to the execution stage, trying to find alternatives, trying to find recycled resources. You know, the example of the bridges was fabulous you know just really trying to see how every little detail can be implemented at you know the lowest possible uh, carbon footprint or with as much recycled material as possible so I think that's 
where we need to close the gap, and I mean everyone who is here, I think is trying to do their best to do it, but you know, this is where I think we, we will be focusing our action, and these presentations are very useful, right? Because it yeah. shows us that it can be done, you yeah. know? There are others who are doing it, let's do it here as well. Yeah, it's about building an ecosystem, and, and maybe, uh, Olaf, you've been in the region, but Signify has been, let's say, one of the, from, from the private parties, one of the, let's say, front runners in circular economy. Can we reflect a bit on, on, from the company perspective, we're talking about business models and you, you, at a certain point you have to take a step like that. How do you see it from, from perspective of Signify? I think in the past uh, years we have seen uh, quite a few uh, initiatives being taken here that uh, go give more attention to sustainability. So we have, for example, uh, if, I, if I look at our own uh, activities, involvement in energy saving projects. Uh, uh, replacing all the lights in the airport and taking the responsibility for the energy saving uh, uh, performance as well as the lighting performance. Um, uh, there are, uh, there, yeah, you see in the region in Saudi Arabia for, uh, specifically a big uh, replacement going on in uh, street lights, uh, replacing the traditional uh, uh, energy consuming lights to more sustainable uh, LED uh, solutions. Um, and now we see slowly that we can start implementing also some more circular concepts. Uh, we have, for example, uh, 3D, uh, 3D printed uh, products, lighting products that, that are made from recycled plastics uh, that we now also slowly start to implement here in the market. Uh, we're, not, we're not exactly yet, I would say, at, uh, at a, a scenario where, where, we, uh, where our ambition is and where also the ambition of the government is. But uh, you have to start with something. And uh, these are, let's say, concrete examples where you can uh, contribute. So that, that's what we try to do as Signify, you know, uh, develop solutions that can be applied uh, in, in concepts like a circular economy. Yeah, and also to tap into the, the thing about the business models. Um, I, I can imagine that at certain points you would have to say, you know, we, we have this LED lighting, versus, uh, which is circular, versus the, the regular ones, uh, but this comes at a higher price. But what's the, what, what's the takeaway on that, on what's the discussion about? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, sometimes the investment is a bit higher eh, for this kind of solutions, and we can uh, try to take away that burden. Uh, and you can think of, for example, the... Uh, uh, Lux as a service uh, concept, eh, where we, uh, where you don't invest in the lighting equipment, but uh, it, it, uh, it's basically you're paying uh, at, at a subscription basis almost uh, for the lighting that you uh, that you acquire. Eh, we implemented this. The minister already mentioned it this morning in the in the video uh, in uh, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. Uh, but there are also some other examples uh, where this is implemented. Yeah, so it's OPEX versus CAPEX, right? And that, that's, I think, yeah, the, the important part. Um, Raya, from, from your perspective, what, what, what's your takeaway on what you've seen so far and also your, your own experience in the region? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, mean, it's quite, I mean, Katrina said it quite right, that there needs to be a top-bottom top bottom approach and a commitment to drive a circular economy. But some of the presentation today were quite inspiring because it showed the role of the private sector, it showed the roles of innovation, of, of the bottom-up approach. So it's kind of top-down, bottom-up combined approach, public-private partnerships that will kind of lead us to solutions. But before really talking about solution in the region, from my, my perspective, it's kind of stepping back and really trying to define what circular economy is. We very much associated with recycling, with recycling the waste, but actually it's about designing the the waste out, is designing the concept of waste out. It's about a systematic approach. We need to rethink how we do products. We need to rethink how we do building. And, and this morning, there was a very good point about, it was very hard to, to think about, to, to build the building for this assembly. And it's we need to think about building for this assembly. We need to think about building for, for long life. So it's more about that change in mindset, that, that acknowledging that it's not about recycling waste, but it's rethinking how we produce assets, products, and other, and it's quite important to acknowledge that and, and share thoughts and lessons learned around that aspect of circular economy. Yeah, right, three said. And, and, and Arnaud, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, we talk about public-private collaboration and how to, well, well to, to spark this and to, 
uh, yeah, instigate this system approach. What's your takeaway on that, Arna? Yes, uh, in the end, it's, it's um, um, the rethinking is very important uh, uh, to to grasp the, the the concept of circular economy. So it's, um, um, but it's not only rethinking from one party or one uh, company uh, by itself. It's uh, the, the the whole ecosystem. So you need to collaborate uh, uh, together in the value chain, cross sectors, um, public private. But for that, it's really essential that. Um, there is vision, there is courage to, to uh, get things uh, going, uh, because this is one um, example of um, a courage to, uh, to start something um, uh, outside the box, outside the circle. I, I like that, that one. Um, um, and to, um, to uh, get trust between the, the stakeholders. And I think that that's something which governments um, uh, can do much more than, uh, um, than before. We, sometimes we underestimated our, uh, our, um, our role as a, as a convener, as um, uh, the one to, uh, to create the platforms uh, needed for the, that uh, systematic change. And I, th I, I think that the um, uh, Emirates uh, government can do a lot on local and on federal level uh, to um, get those um, um, innovative people, those creative people together um, to make the change. And uh, well, I think that's uh, something we, uh, we try to do in the Netherlands and, uh, and in Europe, but um, uh, I think it's crucial for, um, for those innovation needed for all those planetary crises we, we talked about. Yeah, so also if we, we want to tap into the top-down approach, um, as we, yeah, I, I guess you, you also pointing out the, the role of the government in, in the UAE to play. What, what's your experience on that? Maybe the Netherlands is a bit different than UAE, well, it's, but it's, what, it's, what's the next step yeah, to, to take yeah. the market to well, accelerate on that? Well, I, I think with um, uh, public procurement, you can, you can steer in, in, uh, in the value chain. We did it in the Netherlands uh, also with, within our government. We, um, we built uh, national roads and, uh, and, uh, and waterways. Uh, we can uh, uh, use our public procurement in such a way that uh, innovations are, are stimulated. We, we uh, engage with a lot of companies that's um, really unique to build cir circular Videx. We didn't do it before, and we didn't know um, what, um, uh, what to tender. Uh, but we um, created a an learning um, uh, environment with those, uh, those companies to, um, uh, to see what we can do uh, much more um, outside what we are, uh, are used to. Uh, yeah. So I think that's um, something uh, yes, you have to do, yeah. but it's a need, you need courage for that um, uh, and uh, also creativity um, uh, yeah. between all those stakeholders. Uh, and maybe Katrina, if you then reflect on what, what's happen, what will happen locally, I mean, you, Lindsay talked about green procurement, um, how's the government working on that and what, what, what would help to start those kind of programs and to yeah, implement it at the local public I, procurement. I agree. I mean, government has and will always have here uh, an important role to play given, um, given the importance of government entities, but also large government-owned companies that own assets, own infrastructure, are developing new projects. Uh, green procurement is important. Uh, there are some of the leading companies in the region that, and by region I mean mainly UAE and Saudi, that are implementing green procurement principles. It is not, yes, a mass adoption, right? <laughs> That's what we would like to see. So, um, but let me, let me take it from a bit of bigger picture because um, recently we've seen a few very interesting initiatives that I think can lead to more adoption of green procurement, but also something that is very important for circular economy, which is the whole life cycle approach. I think the whole life cycle approach is sort of a step before circular economy in this region. You know, understanding costs of assets as we build them and as we operate them together. It's something new, and we don't talk enough about that. At least, you know, when I talk to our clients, the understanding of that topic is not there yet. But what I wanted to mention is an example of an ADQ, um, 
Abu Dhabi uh, asset uh, owner uh, with their portfolio companies. Recently, they introduced uh, ESG policy. Their ESG policy is calling on each of their portfolio companies individually to be a leader, ESG leader in their own industry, right? Which includes sustainable procurement, grid procurement practices, right? So if, again, <laughs> top down, if we can start with these very publicly visible companies adopting these practices, it will trickle down through the system. So that's where I would uh, focus the attention. Uh, these government-owned companies and government entities, you know, from my perspective, all of them should go down the road of sustainable procurement systems. And we have some examples. Um, I don't know whether Lindsay mentioned, but we've, for example, developed a sustainable procurement system for Aldar. You know, it's up on their website. It's a fantastic example that others in the region could follow. Yeah. Do, Arna, do, do you see opportunities to collaborate between governments on, on a topic like that? Yes, of course. Um, um, I think that um, um, what a government can do, and sometimes um, a circular eco economy uh, looks like a very, very broad, but also um, uh, abstract uh, concept. Um, and to make it very concrete, what can you do as a government um, on the local level and on the national level uh, to um, uh, concretely uh, um, um, take uh, initiatives, um, uh, um, direct the market with, um, with uh, certain goals, um, yep. but also uh, showing that you um, can be of value in, um, uh, in collaborative uh, approaches. Yep. So there are a lot of uh, instruments we can use in, um, uh, in helping the industry, helping the market uh, change. Um, and with um, um, a clear spot on the uh, uh, dot, dot on the horizon um, it can help uh, industry to to move uh, towards um, uh, circular buildings and and, and infrastructure yep. uh, but it helps also to um, get the um, the right um, uh, innovations um, come to the table so it's a, a big and a small companies um, which can help um, uh, change uh, change the system um, and I think that governments uh, can do a lot, and I'm already, uh, um, uh, well, I had made the appointment uh, to, uh, to discuss with the local government here in, in du Dubai, but also with the federal government to um, exchange uh, experiences, and, uh, and of course uh, we can share a lot of uh, knowledge um, uh, about what our instruments are, and how we develop that, and how we implemented uh, that. So it's not only about uh, concepts, it's also about um, uh, practicalities, uh, uh, implementation of, uh, of policies, yep. which are crucial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I know Bura Hapelt is working on some nice landscaping projects around also uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, what, what do you miss in this? I, I think there can be some nice pilot projects. Does it help to, to align international governments 100 percent. and maybe if i can maybe address a question to you and, and yeah. step back it's, it's like having an understanding of actually what government do and and thinking about it you mentioned about uh the the example doing public procurement and taking a project as an example that's one of them but then there is regulations uh there is standards rethinking the building standards rethinking the building regulations and there is the economic instruments which are the taxes the fi financial means and it would be really good to hear what, what, were, what worked best, what, what maybe had a higher impact, because this region is a region where the, it, it's more about incentive rather than the stick approach to some extent. So, and it would be great to hear and share thoughts on, on that aspect from your perspective. Well, Sorry, I deviated a little bit, but no, I was no, just no, perfect. It. Go ahead. Good. Yeah. Well, well, to, to mention one example, um, sometimes because uh, regulations I can imagine that um, it's difficult for the government to do because regulations uh, are not um, um, uh, market um, um, parties. Uh, so the private sector is not uh, always enthusiastic about regulations uh, from the government. Um, but my experience is, is that sometimes um, um, the market is asking for regulations uh, also to... Uh, to um, um, to help industry innovate and to help industry um, uh, change them and change the market. So there are a lot of market opportunities 
uh, if we build the right uh, incentives uh, uh, from government. And um, like an EPR system, um, uh, extended producer responsibility scheme um, on the facade uh, uh, management, but also on, on other products and uh, um, um, uh, like the packaging uh, uh, sector, by example. Yep. Um, um, EPA an EPR system, you could um, envisage that as a regulations from government, but um, in the end, it's um, it's a collective innovation instrument yep. for for the whole sector. Yep. So uh, it's also about uh, framing and and um, looking from the perspective of the of the companies. Um, what is needed to uh, to incentivize the market and um, well help the good uh, companies to um, uh, to innovate. Olaf, if we talk about topics like that, do, do, do you do you agree? From yeah, I think so. The the uh, we see in uh, various countries around the world, Europe, but also here, that there there's been a drive, for example, uh, to regulate uh, energy efficiency, uh, how to use uh, more uh, sustainable materials. Uh, that's there. As a, being a market leader, we sometimes think that uh, the regulations are a bit modest. Eh? It can be uh, it can be uh, stretched a bit further. So I think if you were looking for true innovation and uh, really taking the next step, uh, regulation in itself is not always sufficient. You really have to try indeed to, to, to create some kind of incentive, a nice uh, and, and, and uh, fruitful uh, environment and, and ecosystem in which uh, this can grow uh, not only by regulation but also as a kind of uh, incentivized uh, system of, of innovations. If we talk about uh, uh, in innovations, um, we have uh, with us also the chair of the top team creative uh, industries, uh, Jan de Waal. Um, Jan, uh, maybe I can borrow your microphone for, for, for a bit. Um, what, what, it all starts with, with, with design and creativity, and, and how do you uh, see the discussion going? Where do you think it starts, the, the innovation part? Oh, well, uh, actually, I see two topics. Uh, one. Thank you very much, all of you, this, these great examples of, of the power of design. Yep. And it's not only about technology integrating in a solution, it's also about the imagination of, of going beyond uh, what traditional products maybe are, or in, especially in the built environment. So I think that's, that's a really great, not only this, this, this award-winning uh, pavilion, but also all its elements and uh, the examples we saw. The second part is, I guess, and I, I'm very um, well convinced that this is, of course, it's a systematic uh, challenge, right? Yes. Um, but it's also a challenge of, aim, of scaling up, and how do we scale up? Uh, one program I'd like to address is what we did together with the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Water Affairs. It's uh, circular by design. It's called CIRCO, and it was all about how can we co-create between designers and the industry to create a sustainable business model, because we all know that it's all about the different supply chain, it's uh, how do you integrate uh, imagination, uh, technology, uh, the economics, and then scale up. And I think uh, that program, it's a, actually a trainer-trainer program, is pretty successful, and that's one way to, uh, to address the problems you already uh, put on the table. Yeah. Katrina, from your side, do you agree? Are, are there kind of programs li like Jan? Jan yeah, I, I, I like the idea. I, I think, you know, in order to scale and spread the adoption of this type of practices, generally, I think we need the spectrum, right? We need the standards. And there is a great example from energy efficiency with uh, ESMA, the Emirates Standardization and Metrology Authority that issued energy efficiency standards for different type of appliances in UAE and at the beginning everyone was a bit skeptical about it but the adoption followed. Is it ideal? Probably not but you know it's, it's going somewhere and it's progressively upgrading the standards. So I think what we are missing is a certification scheme or a, some type of standard that would give products the circular economy circular, construction circular, whatever label, right? So that yep. the buyers can know that this is an alternative because the issue that we see from the client side, they are asking, okay, if I'm not using this type of concrete cement steel, what should I be using, right? And, and I know that in other countries there have been these certification mechanisms that were introduced. So that's one side. The other side of the spectrum is what you see. It's the sort of like the, the dreaming, imagining what the best in class could look like. Like, right? So on one side we set the standards, but then at the same time I think 
this country is very good at showing the best in class what that could look like, right? And yep. that will push the market to where we want it to be. Yeah, yeah. Raya, do, 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 you, do you agree? And do you see a certain momentum? I think the World Expo, of yeah, course, yeah. is a momentum to do so. D definitely. Do you think it will have a, a spring off? Yeah, definitely. I think the Expo is a, is a great example, but also the policy that was launched and a number of initiatives are expected to be launched yep. that grabs on the momentum. But I think what the interesting thing that you mentioned earlier is, is we're used to within a, val a value chain of, of the built environment or the construction industry in the silo thinking. The manufacturer works by itself, the contractor works by itself, the designer works by itself. And actually, having a group or a consortium is having every person collaborating, thinking about how to make that product buildable, lasting, and also for this assembly. So that moving out from that silo thinking and connecting the different party of the value chain and supply chain is definitely a challenge and the collaboration is definitely a solution. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and, and maybe to, to, yeah. to add, because um, that's uh, what, uh, what the circle pro program is, yeah, exactly. is exactly to, to, to connect those, uh, those people uh, together in the value chain, uh, to rethink the, the business model uh, to, uh, to the, the materials used. Um, nowadays, uh, because of the circle program, we, 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 think, we think differently, um, um, and we are now uh, planning to... Um, to uh, organize also meetings uh, within companies, uh, between the, um, the designers, the procurers, the marketeers, yep. um, and the, um, uh, the, the CEOs, the managers. Because um, um, the CEO can have a vision where, where they have to, to go, but um, uh, it, it, it's the experience of, uh, of big companies like uh, Philips uh, um, that they, for the, for the fundamental change, they need all the, um, the perspectives of those uh, procurers, uh, marketeers, etc., uh, to change the system. And I think that's, uh, that's also learning from, uh, from us uh, in the Netherlands that, um, well, if you want uh, to, to work together, um, not only as a government um, with the industry, but the industry itself can do a lot uh, between the, the companies, uh, but also within the companies itself, themselves. Yeah, yeah. Michiel, from your perspective, what's your takeaway on this, if you listen to the discussion? Uh, yeah. All what has been said is true, of course, but I think yep. what you say about top-down, um, I think that's essential. Uh, I'm coming here now for three years, and what struck me the most is the enormous ambition of this country. And you can, they set goals for, let's say, in 50 years. And of course, you can question whether these goals are achievable or realistic. But I really prefer that climate, that entrepreneurship, to stimulate startups to come up with their innovations and to find funding to, from startup to scale up. And yes, maybe you arrive half the way or 75% of that ambition. But still, you have uh, uh, created a big push. So, and we as industry, I'm, I'm representing, let's say, the construction industry, we are dependent from those, from that governance, from that regulation. So, yes, make it part, make it tangible, make it part of the financial system, make it part of a building coding system, and challenge the industry. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Because, let's say, we as designers, um, there's a famous saying, everything uh, of value is vulnerable. We can design everything, but we're depending on the people with the money, the, the pension funds, the construction companies, to believe in that. And that should be secured by very high ambitions from uh, the government. Yeah, thank you. Yes, of course. I already saw you waving. Yeah. My name is Bart Weyman. I live already more than 10 years here. I live in uh, Ashman. So it's, not, it's a very nice area. It's not like in Dubai, maybe. And I know how it goes with base guys. I come from Holland. I come from the side that I have to do everything separately, batteries, whatever I have to do, even bulbs I have to make separate. And here, everything goes in the bin, unfortunately. Yep. I have to learn that also myself. Secondly, when you have some ways like big things, in Holland, you have to bring it to the special place and they break it down here you put it outside the door and people pick it up because there's also yep. circulate yep. a way of doing I mean many things goes in small way also circular here yep. 
I live in, uh, I work in the, in the industrial area of Sadia. There the people with a small bicycle go in all the containers. They find metal, they find plastic, they find paper. Small circular industry. Yep, yep. And that's an industry nobody talks about here. No. Yeah, and, and, and it's something, and it's also a social, social it's a very thing. strong part. Yep. So if you can, because it's all driven by economy, basically. Yep. If you can stimulate that part, already yep. a lot will be done, very practically, well done. And I, of course, agree. I want to separate my plastic and my and my and my um, yep. food and vegetables and you know and paper, like yep. we do in Holland. Those three are the most important ones. And not possible. They can easily do it in the building. Yeah. I tell you something else. So, so, sorry, because we, we're a bit on a time time schedule, but but, but please, please stay with us because we also have the plastic and waste discussion afterwards. Oh. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. To hate to interrupt you, but. We're a bit on on a schedule. Please, please stay, stay with us. And uh, but but I fully agree that it's a part of the social uh, discussion as well, to to reach out to the circular economy. I think there's a question over here. No, I don't have a question. I oh, have sorry. something to add. Something to add, please. <laughs> My name is Barbara Wolfensberger. I'm Director General of Culture and Media and Creative Industries in the Netherlands and part of the top team. Yep. And so I was very glad and we're very happy with the Circo uh, development. What I'm missing as an element in the value chain is the point of view of the citizen, the human uh, element. Because we are all talking about sectors and, and uh, regulations and public-private uh, uh, cooperation. But I think one of the main in, uh, things about creative industries and designers is not only the imagination, which is very important because you can't build a house before you have to draw it first. You have to first make your idea, but is to put the human um, aspect and the citizen at the heart of your solution. Because we can think of lots of things in technological uh, novelty, novelties, but if if the citizens don't accept it, you will be in court for ages. You have to take, uh, uh, you have to not only give a solution, you have to make people's lives better and through imagination show them how it can be. Because now people are really uh, scared of all the, uh, all the problems we have and all these um, uh, uh, problems we are trying to fix, but we're not, not trying to fix yep. things, we're trying to make it better. And we have to inspire them to come with us on this journey to, uh, 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 through creativity and technologically, uh, technology together. Yep. I think uh, the human element is very important to keep into the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, maybe also, yeah, Michiel, you want to uh, briefly reflect? Very briefly to add to that, I think you're completely right. And that's also what we tried with this pavilion, that technology should not be abstract. And only if technology is inspired by nature, then we can, as humans, relate to it. So. The, the nature is so smart in finding solutions. Uh, so basically, that's what I want to add. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe, um, can, can I ask you all to maybe in, in one minute also reflect on, on, on what's been said? But also, of course, these sessions, we like to make it tangible. What could be, let's say, it's, it's a short discussion. We'll have discussions afterwards. We're here all day, so I, I hope to make it tangible. There's a big COP event, I think, coming up. So what should we do to, let's say, spark something that's not there yet, that, that you're missing? And then maybe, especially looking to you, uh, Katrina, about what, what, what you see here in the region. Sure, I'll start. So, Raya, I mean, can I start with you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I do think that the starting point is creating this consortium, this partnership. I'm, I'm now talking about the construction industry and as we're talking about construction, but having this consortium, this group of people talking to each other, trying to define what an optimal solution and what a circular economy would mean. But also ensuring that whatever product gets out of it is adopted, is aligned with what people want, is aligned with, with, with what people need. So, and having, having that uh, feedback and that consortium, I think is, is definitely uh, quite important. But the other key thing is also collaboration with other part of the world and discussion with yourself and other to try to learn from the lessons learned what worked, what didn't work, what drive and change, what had a bigger impact, and build on that for uh, for the region here. Uh, and to your opinion, what should be the platform to facilitate that that continuous discussion? Uh, I mean, it could be. A lot of governments sort of around circular economy are called circular economy institute, or, or there's a number of forms that you can initiate a, government's or a governance around yep. circular economy. 
But there is also a, a lot of existing initiative on from the governmental side and the same time from the university side and the private sector side. So I, I do see tapping into any of the existing platform, whether it's a Green Building Council or, or whether it's the like, to tackle and to tap and to integrate the circular economy agenda uh, within it. So a, a Green Building Council, I think, is a good, good starting point uh, for the region because it kind of set that semi-governmental body. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so that, that, that would be my, my thoughts and opinion. Thank you very much. So will we meet again for the, for, for the next event? Hopefully. Are you yeah. going to be there? So that it's about continuing this discussion, right? Yeah. Yeah, if, if you're still here, yeah. Um, Katrina, over to you. Well, I, I have a very specific suggestion, which I, I think would be fantastic to develop and then implement over the coming eight months in the run-up to the COP28, right? I think there is a room for a consortium that would include one of the large asset owners in Abu Dhabi uh, with the whole examples from the whole value chain, right? Uh, in order to, to define what would be the circular economy specifications for the construction industry and then apply it on one example or project. <laughs> yep. And one of the objectives of such a collaboration should be to identify the circular economy certified or labeled alternatives to what we are currently using in the construction industry, whether it's products, material processes, right? Because that, that's where we face the challenge right now. Yep. Uh, it's in the push and pull, right? So that we need to have the pull, we need to have the clients asking for it, but then the market has to provide those alternatives and identifying them will help with the, with the pull with the clients. Yeah, yeah. So Th that's what you should discuss. That's, that's the next step. Yeah, th thanks a lot for that. Uh, Olaf, over to you. Yeah, so I think one of the possibilities to have this discussion is uh, this circularity board, I think it's called, that was recently installed by the Ministry of Economy. Uh, I was invited, uh, I think last month it was, uh, to have a discussion about uh, challenges and possible directions for solutions between several sectors of, uh, of industries. So I think that's a nice, uh, nice initiative. Uh, looking at ourselves uh, and looking also at our customers, uh, it's a fair comment that we need to uh, put uh, also the, the people and the citizens uh, first. Uh, we, can, we can create products uh, that are more and more customized. People have more and more their own uh, uh, opinions and needs. And with uh, our 3D printed products, people can make basically their own designs while still uh, using these fully recycled uh, materials. Um, and when it comes to uh, another, let's say, easily implementable uh, solution, we also look at public lighting, uh, where we can, uh, because these are typically assets that are installed for a very long period of time, sure. but yep. the electronic components inside uh, don't always uh, make it that long. And we can, uh, just like we did in the old days with uh, the conventional lamps, uh, upgrade the products and, uh, and recycle the used materials. So these are elements that we are looking at from our perspective, and we are uh, also always happy to participate in discussions around the sectors uh, to see uh, what more can be done. Yep. All right. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll come back to you, Arnaud, okay. because uh, we, we also have an online audience. Okay. Yep. And I would like that there, there is a question to, to Helene also. Um, and uh, Helene, are you ready for it? Because uh, yeah, yeah. How, how could a circular economy <laughs> relationship between uh, Groningen Seaport and the UAE further develop? In which fields are you looking for collaboration? So that's also if we you know, want to make it concrete and into a next step, what would be your answer? I think they'll turn it on. Yes. I'm still connected. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 good question. Uh, we really love to work with uh, the ports here. Uh, yesterday already uh, some connection was made there with the, the port uh, in Abu Dhabi, I think, as well. And uh, what we really would like is that the uh, ships that we have uh, from Groningen Seaports that go to the ports here, that uh, they work together with the local recyclers for their shipping waste, of course. So there will be a connection. Yep. But we also want to uh, uh, inspire each other in working in the value chain and the public-private uh, uh, partnerships. And we also have quite a lot of companies that are settling in Europe, but are also interested in settling in this region. So I already have made some connections there because uh, this is a completely different market as well, of course, so a big opportunity. So I think trade in both ways will be, uh, will be a big chance as well. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, 
Arnaud, may I ask you to connect those dots? I hear the port of <laughs> um, Abu Dhabi, Groningen, Bureau Hapald is involved, COP28, I don't know, may maybe it is something to do. A lot of nice uh, connections, but I yep. like the idea of um, using the Climate Comp uh, 28 um, next year uh, to use it as a dot on the horizon to say uh, what can we do to show um, uh, the, the world audience, uh, which uh, will be there in, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi next year, um, to show what uh, the circular economy, uh, with all the innovations, but also the connections between um, um, companies, harvests, uh, um, um, and uh, governments, can do to help uh, solve the climate uh, crisis. I think if we could, um, uh, could show that, um, uh, at the COP28, uh, it would be really great. It would be very impactful. And I, I'm hoping that uh, we can collaborate very closely with, um, uh, with the Dubai government, but also with the uh, federal government here, um, um, to get things moving um, in such a way that the three ministers of um, environment, um, of uh, um, economy, um, economic affairs and industry, um, are there, um, shown with pride what um, has been achieved between now and, um, uh, and next year, uh, already to, to show that, it's, um, uh, that they are committed to, uh, to the circular economy and, uh, the, um, of course, the climate uh, neutral economy in 2050 or 2060, what, uh, yep. what goals yep. there, there are. Are you on board for, for yeah, next totally. year? Yeah? <laughs> Katarina, same for you? Yeah, it was my suggestion, so I am. <laughs> yes. No, no. <laughs> Very good. Olaf, you as well. Huh? So I would like to thank you all for, for joining this panel discussion. I, I think, you know, it's always time wise too short, but we have the opportunity to continue our discussion. I think as a next step in the program, we've been talking about it, we've been seeing it, but it's also about experiencing it. And Michiel, I think you are going to show around some of the people. I don't know where you went, Michiel, but I'm sure we'll, we'll meet him. Maybe he already went on top of the dome. I don't know. We'll meet him. Um, for now, I would like to thank the panel, uh, our speakers, and uh, the audience over here, Holland Water, also to make this event possible. And of course, everyone involved from the, the Ministries of Foreign Affairs, Infrastructure, Water Management, RVO, the Netherlands Embassy, and, uh, and of course, thank you all online for, for joining us. And I would like to invite you to stay tuned because we're going to be back in at 2 o'clock for a further discussion on plastics and waste management. And thank you very much for joining. See you later. Bye-bye.